Subway has teamed up with Live Nation to bring you great food and great music for a great value. Right now, buy a Subway $5 footlong and get a Live Nation concert ticket for $5 to participate in Live Nation shows like Nickelback, The Fray, and Crew Fest 2. Ticket price does not include fees. See store for details. Subway, eat fresh. Eat, eat fresh. The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. First of all, this is the BS Report with Bill Simmons. It might be cool, I don't know. And if it's not, I don't care. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons works for ESPN. He's also named the sports guy, and he writes a comical sports column. He must be a popular dude. The BS Report. It's got a real dirty sound. Like a rusty steak knife cutting through a well aged steak. No. 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 Here's Bill Simmons. All right, welcome to the BS Report. The ESPYs were last night. Uh, I'm proud to say I'm not hungover. I am very tired, though. One person not at the ESPYs last night who I thought might be there, uh, one of our most famous athlete Twitterers. A member of the Minnesota Timberwolves and now in the BS Report on the Subway Fresh Take Hotline, Mr. Kevin Love. What's happening? What's going on? I wasn't at the ESPYs last night. I had to report to Summer League for the Timberwolves. I had to go out there. Wasn't playing. Made it back last night. Was a little too tired to go to the after parties, but I did not make it, so I was a little upset about that. Well, why would you have to go to Summer League if you're not playing? I don't get it. I don't know. Just so I could check in. Uh, I know that David Kahn, our new GM, wanted to see me. Uh, also, you know, some of our front office guys they wanted to just check in. So, um, you know, so you got to look at you got to look at Johnny Flynn. Yeah, exactly. They wanted me to play with Johnny a little bit, but also, you know, head back to uh, Vegas in another week for USA basketball. So we'll uh, they'll get to see me then too. So, what's the USA basketball? Uh, it's like the uh, select team, kind of like last year after. Um, you know, after summer league, a bunch of us guys we played against the uh, Olympic team, but now it's just all the young guys. You know, kind of, it's not really a tryout, but it's a mini camp. So we're just going out there and, uh, you know, trying to show our stuff, I guess. So it's all your generation. That sounds cool. Like, who's on the team? Oh, that's pretty cool. Um, you know, like Blake Griffin will be there. Myself, um, Derek Rose, Kevin Durant, Greg Oden, nice um, Al Horford, players like that. Wait, Al Horford and Blake Griffin. That, those guys play your position. Yeah, I know. You got you got to beat them out. Don't sit on the yeah, bench. Yeah, I have to try to beat them out, I guess. So. Well, let's talk about uh, let's talk about the T Wolves first because you know I wanted to be the GM. I'll be honest, and and it hurt, and I wanted us to work together, and I, I thought we were going to have a great relationship, and uh, and it didn't happen. But you have a new GM, new direction, all that stuff. Are you happy with how things are going? Um. I guess we got to let it play out a little bit. I also, uh, you know, people were tweeting me, would you like Bill Simmons to be your GM? I said, of course. I was putting it out there for everybody to see. But I appreciated that. Like you said, um, you know, it didn't work out that way. But, you know, I'm liking the way things are going. I know that, um, you know, with drafting Rubio, we got a lot of heat, drafting all the point guards that we did. Um, But I think that Flynn is dynamite. Like I said, I was in summer league. I got to play with him last week. Yeah. Um, Or this past week, I'm sorry. And, uh, you know, with with Rubio, I guess we can use him as trade bait. Um, I like Wayne Ellington. I like, you know, the trades that we made. So I think that we are moving in the right direction as far as, you know, our youth right. goes. And, uh, you know, Big Al is ahead of schedule. Corey Brewer is back to uh, full strength now. So, you know, we're young. You know, we're getting healthy. So hopefully next year we'll, uh, you know, come out with a pretty good swagger and come out, you know, winning more than 24 games. I love the Rubio pick, and I, I thought there were three potentially special guys in the draft, and I thought he was one of them. I really like Johnny Flynn, but I thought, to me, Rubio is, was the home run pick. I couldn't believe he slipped to five. And now it looks like, you know, for you, you're one of the more unselfish guys out there. Your game's kind of predicated on the outlets, and, you know, you grew up watching Wes Unsell tapes, all that stuff. I just thought the combo of you and Rubio would have been fantastic. And now it's like, is it going to happen? Is it not going to happen? Have you contacted him? Have you emailed him? Anything? Well, I've actually been doing, uh, trying to get my Rosetta Stone tapes in, but they still <laughs> haven't, they haven't sent them to me yet. But um, right. you know, I, I need to learn to speak a little bit of Espanol first before I, you know, get to speak to him. But you know, maybe a translator. That. You get a translator to translate the whole conversation. Yeah, exactly. That's all. That's all I need, right? But you'd love playing with him, though. I mean, this would be fantastic. Oh, no question. And he. I mean, just the way I, you know, I watched all the Olympic games where he played, and especially in the championship when he, uh, right, uh, you know, went up against the, you know, per 
premier guys in the NBA, the U.S. Olympic squad, and he was unbelievable being, you know, 17 years old at the time, going up against, you know, Chris Paul, Darren Williams, Jason Kidd, those type of guys, those caliber guys, and holding his own. I thought it was, you know, just unbelievable. But Yeah, explain explain to everybody how unbelievable that was, because this is part of my case of why Rubio should have been either the first or second pick in the draft. To be 17 and to play on that stage against basically – Chris Paul and Darren Williams, the two best point guards in in the world, and to hold your own, I thought that was unbelievable. Could you have done that at age seventeen? I, I'm not sure I could have. I'm not sure many people could have because yeah. I mean, you think of you know whether it's the Western Conference Finals or the Eastern Conference Finals or even the NBA Finals. You know that you know basically all all of America is watching, all the fans uh, you know that watch NBA basketball. But you take it up a stage and you're in the Olympic uh, gold medal final. Yeah. 17 years old playing against those caliber of players, and the whole world's watching. I mean, and you don't that, stink. And he didn't stink. Yeah, and he didn't stink. He didn't kill him. Like, and you know, it wasn't like he knew he was going to play because Calderon got hurt during the tournament, and now suddenly he's thrust in the situation that basically, hey, here are the car keys. It's up to you whether we're going to make it or not. I thought that was. Uh... And I, the other thing about him, and this is something that you know, I, I think you see, and not a lot of people see, but he's like a split second ahead of everybody. You know, he's one of those guys, maybe in the workouts, maybe he's not lightning fast, all that stuff, but hey, just his brain works a little faster than most guys. And you can see it when you watch him, whether it's the passing, like he just kind of knows where guys are going to be. Um, have you played with somebody like that before in your career? Um, I think, you know, in high school, I don't know about on this stage, I think that Brandon Jennings was a lot like that in high school. Really? Um, yeah, I got to play with him. Um, you know, my sophomore and junior year of high school. And, uh, you know, I thought he was a lot like that. He always knew where I was going to be. We had great chemistry on the court. And we hadn't even played together before, you know, we stepped foot, you know, in a, on the same AAU team. So I thought he was a lot like that in high school. But hmm. I think it's very rare that you see um, a, a player like that. And, he, you know, he's thinking, like you said, two, three steps ahead. You know, I mean, just some of the highlights that I've seen of him and also, you know, watching him play in the Olympics, I just think, you know, he's incredible. And, you know, if he decides to play for us or whoever he plays for, he's going to be, uh, he's going to be incredible. So were you surprised that Jennings went 10th, having played with him and knowing how talented he is? Um, I'm not going to say I was surprised. You know, I talked to him um, on draft day. I said, man, you don't have anything to worry about. You're going to be in the top 10. You're going to be living your dream playing in the NBA. But, you know, he's he's a pretty, you know, frail kid at this point. Um, yeah. I don't know how much more weight he can put on. But, you know, he also has a lot to figure out. I watched him play a little bit in the summer league. Um, you know, I think once the game really slows down for him and, you know, gets a little bit of that chip off of his shoulder, he's going to be uh, just all right. Who is the best guy you played with in high school? Because you guys are always, like, doing the AAU and summer stuff, all that stuff. Who is the single best guy you played with? Best guy I played with? Um, guy that you were like, wow, I would love to end up on the same NBA team with him for the next 12 years. Oh, let's see. Um, probably a Derrick Rose. Um you know, Ooh. playing with him in the uh, 2007 All-American game, McDonald's right. game. I mean, that was just unbelievable. You saw what he did this year. Yeah. Um, you know, rookie of the year. Um, the way he rebounds the ball at his size, the way he passes the ball. I mean, the way he exposed to the basket is just, you know, I, I haven't seen anything like it um, in our class, at least. And um, Yeah, know, I, they, thought, I thought Chris Paul was going to be yeah, – I thought Chris Paul was going to own this next decade for point guards. But – I'm thinking Rose because of his size. And just like you look at what he did last year as a rookie, one year in college, and then goes to the playoffs, actually ups his game, you know, brings it up another right. level. And, I, you know, guys always jump in year two. You certainly made a jump in year two. Um, it just seems like it just seems like he like he's going to do it. Like he's going to – this will be the year for him to be a superstar. And, you know, I think you look at that draft class that you were in with him. That was – Pretty nice draft class. Yeah, I think we might go down as, uh, I think, one of the best of all time just for how, you know, deep it was, especially from our 07 high school class. Like I mentioned, so many players coming out this year as well. I just think that, uh, you know, but as far as our draft class, we're, I mean, we, we really set the bar for the next few years. Yeah, because I think, you know, I look I look at your, I'm, I like looking at stats because I, I think it sounds simplistic, but, you know, you rebound. You're going to get rebounds. So this is why I thought you should have gone higher than you did in the draft. Like, you do things. You're going to shoot 35 to 43% from three. 
you're going to get 10 to 12 rebounds a game and you're going to be fun to play with. Like these are valuable skills that translate into things, you know? And that, that's why I didn't understand why. Did that make you mad? Like coming out of college or some people are like, yeah, maybe, maybe not. But, yeah. I just, I felt like you were a short thing. Right. And, and I mean, it does, I'm not bitter about it, but it did make me a little bit upset because I mean, too many people, you know, focus on, oh, he, you know, he's, he's unathletic. He's only, you know, six, eight and a half, you know, that sort of thing. It's like, you can't jump. Yeah. Can't like... jump. But, you know, at the combines, I tested just as well as anybody. And, right. you know, if you listen to what Bill Russell used to say, and I, I think this still holds true and why I rebound so well is because, you know, he said that 80% of rebounds are below the rim. So you don't have to be the most athletic guy in the world in order to, you know, get offensive and defensive rebounds. So I just took that to heart. And every time I go out and play, I have something to prove. So. Well, I, I, I've seen you in person a couple of times, and you're you're always moving, which to me is the number one thing with rebounding. Because as you said, the rebounds aren't above the basket; they're below, and you have to know the angles. And the guy shooting on the right side, that means the rebound could go either it's going to bounce back to him, or it's going to go to the left side of the basket, and you kind of just know where it's going. And to me, that's an underrated skill because not a lot of guys even put thought into. The rebound's going to go there. This guy's shooting from that spot. That means there are three possible places this rebound can go. Right. And you can just kind of sneak around and, you know, really speed or jumping a bill. I don't think it really matters with the rebound. No, when it comes down to it, it's all, you know, you know, heart, tenacity. I mean, putting everything you can into rebounding the ball. And, you know, there, there's different things to score and there's different things to defense. But as far as rebounding goes, it's just the will to get that ball. And, you know, I have strong enough hands. I'm big enough to where I can get a rebound against different guys, uh, whether it's a Dwight Howard or Shaq. So, mm. you know, I'm not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not scared to go in there and bang with those guys. Was there a guy last year that you were like, oh, my God, this guy is, is a beast. I, I, I just I don't know if I can handle this guy. Probably Shaq. Um, really? You know, I would say this, and and yeah, just hear me out because you know he is at the latter stage of his career. Yeah. I think the thing that went through my mind was if this guy's this strong and this agile this late in his career, I can only imagine what he was like ten years ago. Yeah, that's a good. So point. I mean, that that's what really just you know threw me for a loop. So I mean, I, I feel like if I would have been in the league ten years ago trying to guard him, I would have just had all sorts of problems just like everybody else did but i think um also a guy like dwight howard i know um you know in the finals they you know let him go one-on-one a little bit he didn't have too many moves but yeah i think that uh you know just playing against him and you know seeing his body that's what uh you know all big men kind of want to become did you you got to play against garnett before he got hurt right yeah i did that, i mean that's a i mean that's another guy him him and the guy that I really look up to is Tim Duncan. Those right. two guys, when playing against them, was like, all right, I hope they teach me a lesson because I'm trying to learn right now. <laughs> Did they take you to the woodshed? Uh, Duncan especially, he could, you know, because he was, uh, I think we played the Spurs our second game. He said, all right, young fella, I'm going to teach you a lesson. You know, and he did his little jab step. I stuck my <laughs> arm out. He came up, ended up at the free throw line. The next play, you know, he jab stepped again, faced up, faced up, and, uh, you know, he put it off the glass. He said, I told you I was going to teach you a lesson. You know, so. <laughs> I was so going to ask you if he did the banker. That's kind of his little calling card for the new guys. Yeah. Hey, here's my 15-foot banker. Because oh, nobody exactly. shoots that shot. I mean, that's, that's a shot you never see anymore. So the defenders, if they don't know it's coming, they just, they're blindsided by it almost. Oh, uh, I mean, you have to be honest with him, too, because he can put the ball on the floor. Um, he's going to get fouled or, you know, get a double team him. He's going to kick it out. So he's, you know, the big fundamental for a reason. He's always going to make the right play. But Big Al in practice must have been interesting because that guy, you know, for under 26 players probably has the best collection of low post moves in the league. I think so. That's why I tell everybody. I say as far as low post scoring goes and low post moves and yeah, um, all that goes, I think Al is, you know, by far the best because, like you mentioned, I mean, people see what he does in games and it's unbelievable. You know, he'll have, you know, 35 and 20. Yeah. But, you know, in practice, he'll score the ball every time he touches it. It's unbelievable. Well, we, you know, I'm a Celtics fan, so I watched him grow up a little bit. And he had bad luck in the Celtics. Like, every time it seemed like it was he was coming on, he'd, he'd like, sprain his ankle. Right. Or he'd, you know, strain his knee. It was always, like, just a series of dumb injuries that kept sidetracking him. And I happened to be watching the game when he got hurt last season. It was devastating because he, he had been putting together basically a two, three-week stretch where it was like, he finally, he's put it together. This is it. He's now the best low post scorer in the league, and he freaking gets hurt. Like, it was, you know, and you guys were, you could see it on the court. You guys were all devastated. Like, it was just oh, yeah. sad. 
I mean, we were rolling too, and yeah. just, just the the play that it happened on. I think there was like you know less than thirty seconds left, and he just you know barely bumped knees. I forget with, with who it was in New Orleans, but he just barely bumped knees with the guy. It looked like came down on it wrong, and I mean that was it. And we didn't figure out until uh, you know two days later when we were uh, you know right. were in the weight room, you know lifting before practice. They came in and told us, "Hey, out," you know, towards ACL. So that was devastating for us. We had just went. You know, ten and four in January. Yeah, so we were looking out for us. We knew we weren't going to make the playoffs, but we were making something of our season. And then, you know, our big horse goes down. He's only one of three players in the league that averages twenty and ten. So that was tough for us. I happened to see you guys about a week or maybe ten days before you get you guys played the Clippers, and uh, I just thought you had something going. It wasn't just the fact that you know Foy was playing well and Jefferson was coming to his own. You were starting to get you, you know comfortable, but um. You know, our seats are behind the visitors' bench, and it just seemed like everybody was responding to McHale. And, you know, you can notice this stuff from the stands. You really can. You can notice when a team is on the same page with the coach, when they're listening to him, when they respect him. I was shocked that he didn't come back. Were you surprised? Oh, I was very surprised. I was even uh, to the point, you know, I was a little bit, you know, hurt on that regard just because, yeah. um, you know, the first month, month and a half, um, you know, of my rookie season, um, you know, it was tough for me. I didn't. I was only playing 15 minutes a game. I never knew when my time was going to come. Yeah. You know, I was getting cold sitting out there on the bench. So I, you know, I kept working, kept working. He took over as coach, and from that on, he said, you know, young fellow, you're going to make mistakes. I want you to just go out there and play. And that's what I mean. Just you know, learning from him the whole the whole year um, after he became coach, because when he was GM, you know, he was only at practice, you know, one, two days, three days out of the week. Right. You know, when he was coaching, he was there every day, so he was helping me out tremendously. So, I mean, that was, um, you know, that was big for me having him as a coach, and you know, he helped me out. You know, took me to the next level. Let me get, you know, helped me to get twenty nine double doubles. You yeah. Know, playing me twenty five, thirty minutes a night. So it did hurt me that he ended up leaving. And it's not a bad thing to learn from one of the best power forwards in the history of basketball. Yeah, you think? The best low post guy ever. Uh, guy with three rings. Like that's a nice guy to have around. Did you feel like he liked coaching? I don't think I think he liked coaching and he loved the guys that were on the team. Um, yeah. I think from a from a selfish standpoint, I loved having him as a coach because you know he was like you said a great, he was a big man and yeah. you know, he wanted to you know throw the ball into Big Al. Big Al got hurt. He wanted to throw the ball into me, so that really helped me come along. But as far as coaching goes, I don't think he liked the travel. I think that uh, was, he didn't like being away from his family. You know, as being the GM, he got to stay in Minnesota, work things from there be at his house when the team was traveling. So I think the traveling just is what he didn't like. And when he was on the Celtics, in my opinion, he's arguably one of the three, four funniest athletes ever. Oh my was God. he still as funny as a coach? Uh, he's hilarious. I mean, when you really got him to open up, you know, whether it was on the, you know, the team bus, whether it was on the plane, yeah. um, you know, after the game, um, you know, he's, he is one of the, you know, wittiest and, crude, funny guys you'll meet. So I, I enjoyed having him around. <laughs> there was a book in 1991 called Unfinished Business about by a guy named Jack McCallum who spent the year with the Celtics. And McHale was the star of the book. I mean, he was really, like, legitimately funny. Not like, you know, there's athlete funny, athletes that are funny, but they're not really that funny. But he was, like, comedian funny. Oh, you know? no. I mean, he yeah, he breaks all barriers. He's yeah. that dude. I mean, he, I mean, I really think that – I don't think he, he's stand-up funny. Right. But just like how he reacts to certain situations and what he comes up with, uh, it's just hilarious. That dude. I, I, I always thought. Talk for hours. Well, I always thought he could be the John Madden in the NBA. And he yeah. actually did like a year of local TV for the Timberwolves, but then they made him the GM. But I really think that's how his career would have gone. I think he would have eventually ended up making $5 million a year on TV, but it went in another direction. Let me ask you about that January stretch that you mentioned. Because. You know, I know you're rebuilding again, but man, I watched you guys that month, and it, it really didn't seem like you were that far away. Do you? Are you kind of bummed out a little that all of a sudden you're rebuilding again? Yeah, it, it, I mean it's tough. I'm, I'm I'm not so bummed out because you know we are progressing to more of a you know a situation of youth, and I think um, after our draft and you know with our trades, I think that we we, we we've got to be. I know that Golden State was the youngest team last year. Yeah. We've got to be right there in the top, you know, three to five. Right. And, um, you know, so I can't say I'm happy. I can't say I'm unhappy. I'm just, you know, 
right at a meeting with it because I, you know I liked a couple of the couple of the the moves that we made obviously with you know yeah. the Rubio the Flynn I like you know Wayne Ellington anytime you can get a uh, you know Final Four MVP on your team that's never bad and yeah. uh, you know like I said Al's going to come back healthy you know everybody's going to get get a year older but um, you know I feel as uh, as far as January goes I felt like um, you know we were right there. And yeah, I agree. Obviously, big, big Al went out, and uh, you know that was a great stretch for us, and everything was coming together. And like I said, um, I felt like we were going to put, you know, a little bit of a season together. Obviously, we weren't going to make the playoffs, but we we're going to make some of it. And you've been a guy who has always won everywhere you've been, so that must have been weird to be on a team that was all of a sudden headed for a lottery. Oh, it was it was very weird, and I was, you know, the unlucky charm in the draft lottery. I was the first team to move back, but. Right. Um, I had to mention that. Um, <laughs> no, it was uh, you know it was tough losing all that time because obviously we went 36 and three last year at UCLA. Yeah. Um, you know, in high school we were the state champions. Uh, you know, we were ranked top ten in the country. Did you lose more grade. games? Did What's you that? lose more games last year than you did in your entire life? Oh no question. Wouldn't no regardless if it's you know soccer, baseball, all that. Growing up, I think you know we lost more than I lost more than I ever had in my whole life. So that was you know very tough. Yeah, very, very I can tough. imagine. Must be like, I mean, especially get like those eight game losing streaks and stuff. You must be like, what the hell's going on here? Yeah, I think we lost up to twelve in a row at one point. It was like, you know, you can always tell too because the locker room's down. Nobody's really talking to each other. You know, practice people are throwing fits. They're yeah yelling at each other. And then, you know, when you win in five, six, seven games in a row, like in January, you know, everybody's happy. Yeah, you know, we're taking the day off. Everybody's eating together. So. You know, I definitely like winning more than I like losing. I think everybody does. And the team that kind of took your mantle of the young guns that are coming together was uh, the team I'm not going to name, but they used to play in Seattle. But your friend Russell Westbrook, uh, right, I they knew used it before to play. You said it. I know the Russell. So Russell Westbrook ended up being that, on that team. Jealous a little of him? Do you give give him crap? Oh, uh, yeah, I gave him a little, little bit of crap just because, uh, no, he ended up on a great team. I, I'm, you know, I've been friends with, uh, you know, Kevin Durant, um, back when he was on the DC Blue Devils, his first, uh, AAU team with, uh, you know, Ty Lawson and those guys. So, what age are we talking about there? We're talking about, you know, 13, 14 years old. I remember he played in Mike Beasley, with Mike Beasley in Memphis, uh, you know, seventh grade nationals. So, I've known Kevin forever. I think that he's, you know, on the road to be, you know, MVP caliber um, type player. So I agree. Did he have the 28 foot range when he was 13? Yes. He and did. He was, he was skinnier than he was now. With he the long on, arms. On, yeah, uh, long arms, long legs. You know, he wasn't, uh, you know, six ten, six eleven yet. But I mean, he, you could just tell this kid was going to be really good. What really, about Beasley? Really good. Same thing for Beasley or no? Oh, same thing. Beasley. He was wearing the size 22 shoes, trying to, you know, tell everybody I'm gonna be seven three and have these skills. But, you know, Beasley <laughs> was always a little bit out of his mind. But I, you knew he was gonna be good too. How about Anthony Randolph? Did yeah, it, wasn't he everybody. your draft class? Yeah, he I was mean, right. Well, yeah, he was picked 14th, right? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. The last last lottery pick. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, I mean, he, I saw him put up 42 points um, the other night. He was unbelievable. Um, I, I didn't know he'd come along this quickly, but. I mean, you could tell last year if he got the time, you know, he's he's put. I mean, he's grabbing rebounds above the square. He's blocking yeah. shots. He's running the floor coast to coast with the ball, you know, taking the rebound coast to coast, finishing at the other end. So I think he uh, he's going to be special in a couple of years too. Yeah, I wrote a column. I had a like a mailbag or something in last February, and somebody asked, or maybe the topic was which players would you pay to see in person. So I had like eight guys, and one of them just was Anthony Randolph, and I was like, I'll explain later, and. All the Warrior fans were like, no, oh, explain now. Please tell us why. Right. We need something. Right. But the bottom line is the, the guy's the total package. And I, I don't know if mentally he's going to put it together, but when you watch that guy play, I, there's nothing in the basketball court that he can't do. I don't know no. where his career goes. I really don't. It's right. amazing. I mean, it's, all, it's really all up to him. He's going to choose his own destiny because, like you said, that, that, I mean, I, I agree with you 100%. I don't know who couldn't, that he has all the skills the whole package to do whatever he wants on the basketball court. And I mean, you can see it out there. Yeah. Was anybody else in Vegas? Anybody else knock your socks off last week, this week? Um, not, not like he did. Um, I mean, because, I mean, he's really been putting up numbers. Um, I mean, really, 
I mean, the whole time he's been there. I, I just thought that, you know, he was unbelievable in, in everything that I saw. So, I mean, he's got, like I said, his progression from, you know, this time last year to now, yeah. I mean, he, it's just leaps and bounds. What did you work on this summer? Anything? Mostly, you know, my body. Just get my body fat down, really working on running the court. Um, you know, I, I can really shoot the ball. That's what people, you know, fail to realize. I didn't get to... Um, you know, shoot it too much last year, but you know that's something I've really been working on. You know, my 15, 18 footer and extending it um, to NBA range. Um, that was yeah. really something that drew, I think, teams to me last year um, during the draft process. Was you know me shooting that three, coming down in transition, shooting it, and also um, I think you know the two bulls ended up trading for me because I was open. Uh, you know, I was going to open up things for Big Al with doing that, and also you know my passing. Um, too, but I think that that's you know the two things I've really been working on the most. Well, I don't want to gush too much about it, but the fact that you pass like you do makes me happy because you know I grew up weaned on the bird magic era, and it's a skill that's kind of faded away a little bit. And now you're you're bringing it back a little. I think Derek Rose to a little degree, Chris Paul, like some of the unselfish point guards we have now, and Rubio I think is going to be huge. But it kind of feels like passing. Hey, it's kind of fun to be unselfish. Hey, it's it's kind of fun to make my teammates better. I feel like that might come back a little bit. You know what I hate more than anything is over dribbling. Uh, I used to, uh, you know, you just mentioned the uh, the uh, you know Bird and Magic era. Yeah. I used to watch the, uh, you know, I, I was always a big fan of watching, you know, the superstar tapes growing up, and yeah. I used to watch the the Boston, you know, outlet uh, video where the ball would never touch the floor. Right. Right. And, I mean, they just hit the next guy, hit the next guy, hit the next guy. It didn't matter who it was, if it was the center or if it was the point guard, whether it was Dennis Johnson or it was Bill Walton, Robert Parrish, Kevin McHale, it didn't matter who it was. Yeah. And those guys, what's funny about them is they didn't have a traditional point guard. People no. think, and they're the greatest team ever, but it was just kind of five guys who knew how to play, but they weren't really defined roles. Like they would play, sometimes they'd play Walton, Parrish, McHale, and Bird together. Play yeah. Bird at shooting guard. It didn't matter because all the guys knew how to play together. Yeah. And now, as you said, I think it started with Jordan, but it's that whole get out of my way. I'm going to be the hero. You guys stand in your spots, and I'm going to break my guy down off the dribble. And it's not totally how basketball is created. Right. You know? And I, now, I, I like mean, your way more. People think it's the greatest thing in the world where, you know, four or five guys scoring double digits. And, you know, when you see a guy putting up 35, 40 points, you think it's the greatest thing in the world. And it's a little bit off when, you know, a couple guys score 20. Another guy scores 16, another guy scores 14. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you never really see that anymore. No. Well, you know, everybody knows you studied the unsell tapes. How did you learn how to keep the rebound above your shoulder and whip it out at the same time? Like, how much practice did that take? I don't know. It's just all instinctive. My dad would, you know, basically whip my, you know what, if I didn't uh, keep that ball above my chin and, you know, right. keep my elbows up. So, you know, I just basically learned it from there. It's just, you know, a little bit ironic that my middle name is Wesley after Wes Unseld, having my dad <laughs> played with him. But, right. um, you know, that was just, uh, you know, something that just really came instinctive. Um, I could always pass the ball. But, you know, as far as the hand strength and, you know, wrist strength goes, my my dad always had me doing the, the fingertip push-ups. He had me doing a little curl bar with the, you know, the rope attached to the weight and that sort of thing to get my hands strong. So uh, Really? I didn't know that part. Yeah. He had me doing all that. So he would, uh, if I didn't do it, um, he wouldn't want to come home at night. So so how does he feel now watching, like, his finished product son entering his second year in the NBA? Uh, you know, he's a proud father, just like anybody would be in his situation. But, you know, he's always, you know, I talk to him almost every day. He's always asking what I'm doing to get better. So he's still being... Still being the good dad, but he's you know sitting back a little bit and just uh, you know letting it all play out. So how, how does he feel about Twitter? I mean, he <laughs> you know, I was mentioning the other day on uh, you know Sports Nation that he's I mean he still types with the uh, the two fingers, so he doesn't know anything about Twitter. So. Right. So he's not he's not saying instead of Twittering, why aren't you practicing your outlet passes? Exactly. You're up to twenty seven. How, how did you get so much free time? <laughs> How do I get so much free time? No, no, he asked oh. me that. Oh, no, I, th I well, the answer for me is that I, I think they pay me professionally to waste time. That's part of is my gig. I'm a professional time waster. So you're up to 27,522 Twitter followers as of an hour ago. Right. Kevin under slash love. And you, and you made history this summer. You broke a story. You broke the news that Kevin McHale wasn't coming back as Timberwolves coach. Never happened before where an athlete broke a story. Uh, and then the, the, there was an ensuing 
kind of circus about it. Were you, were you kind of stunned by that whole thing? How'd you feel about it? I was a little stunned just because, you know, I was talked into Twitter, like back in, you know, mid-April, right when our season was ending, right after. I was talked into it. I was like, oh, I'm not going to do this Twitter thing. It's just a craze for right now, and I'm not going to do it. But just the fact that three months later, I broke a news story, and it became, you know, you know, it was in AP, it was on ESPN, ESPN.com, it was on Around the Horn, it was on PTI. I thought that was uh, that was pretty un- unbelievable. And I, I didn't realize, I wouldn't say the consequences, but I didn't realize that it was going to, you know, be, you know, that big. I didn't think it was that, you know, big of a deal. I knew that, um, you know, me doing that, you know, people would, you know, get a kick out of it, but I didn't think that, you know, it would be all over the news the next day. So that was a... Uh, a little different for me because I wasn't even going to have a Twitter come, you know, three, four months ago. And now you're calling yourself the big Twitter. Dan Patrick called me the big Twitter. I didn't <laughs> Come on, so just admit it. You like it. You like I, it. No, I do like it. I do. I, I, I think it's really funny, but, you know, I only have, what, 27.5 followers, so. Oh, it's going know, up I after. I get up towards, you know, 100,000, a couple hundred thousand, then I'll be the big Twitter. We'll see. I'm not sure you need a nickname when your name is Kevin Love because people can just call you K Love or there's something something with Love should be your nickname. Yeah, I agree. You know. I agree with you. <laughs> um, so where do you think you see the Twitter thing going? Um, you know, I'm not really sure. I was checking out uh, your Twitter today and I was looking at the uh, oh, the Espy's tw- tweets. Oh, that was uh, the one was so funny about if you're if you're if you're black, yeah, you're, you're wealthy, you're tall, tall. yeah. Yeah, you're gonna do well. What, what happens if you're, you're you're white, unathletic? <laughs> you're rich, not wealthy. Yeah, you, you know what, what happens then? No well, loose you, women for me. Uh, no loose women with hair extensions. I don't know. I have a theory that if you're over like six seven, and you go to the ESPYS, even if you're not a professional player, I think you can still land somebody. Oh, I think yeah. the women just assume they're like, yeah, I got seventy five percent odds. This guy's an NBA player. I'm gonna roll the dice. Yeah, if you're if you're over six seven and look like an athlete and go to the ESPYS, you're uh, you're yeah. In. All you have to do basically, if you're if you're six seven and above, you buy like a two thousand dollars suit, and you just go, and yeah. nobody's gonna. People just think you're like one of the draft picks from the draft class before. You could be any color. All right, but nobody's gonna know. I think you would have enjoyed the ESPYS though, because there was a lot of your brethren, like uh, Duran and Griffin, all those guys. So it was all, all the right. guys you uh, you basically have known. For a while, it seems like since like age thirteen. Like when did you start knowing these guys? Oh man, I've known you know Blake since my sophomore year of high school. Like I mentioned with you know Kevin, I've known Kevin since you know seventh eighth grade. Um, you know I don't know who else was there. If Russell was there, I've not only known Russell since my senior year of high school, but you know just uh you know basically all those guys from you know our draft draft class, the draft class before. Mm. Uh, you know I've known since you know basically grade school or middle school does it hurt the competitiveness at all like you know back in the bird magic era the guys actually like they didn't like each other and it was it was it was business and now it's like you're competing against guys that as you said you've known since you were in junior high school it's got to i mean it can't be that cutthroat right no i mean it's it's still cutthroat though it's like um you know the the guy at the the guy at your same position. You, you you have you know a lot of you know not hatred towards them, but you, you kind of dislike them whether you like to say it or not. Um, right, you're measuring yourself. I like yourself. to be good spirited. I like to be friends with everybody. Kind of mess with everybody, joke around because that's just my nature. But at the end of the day, when we step on those lines, you know I'm coming to you know I'm kind of coming to bust you up. And uh, I think with a guy like Kevin. Durant, you know, we play different positions. We've known each other for so long. Um, it's a lot more free spirited, and you know, we're a lot, you know, cooler than we would be if we played the same position. But at the end of the day, we still are on different teams, and you know, we still want to be bigger stars than the other person. So it's it's tough. It's uh, you know, it's it's cool to be friends off the court, but you know, like I always said, when I step on those lines, it's a, uh, you know, it's a free for all. It's uh, you know, going for that goal. So you're gonna kick Blake Griffin's ass, is what you're telling us. Um, that's you can beat I'm him up. You. Yeah, you're gonna whip I'm, on I'm him. I'm coming after Blake Griffin. I'm I'm coming after, you know, everybody that's at my position. But you know, Blake and I, you know, we have the same agent. Um, I know he got a little heat from you, from the Lamar Odom situation. But you know, we uh, you know, we're gonna come after each other. That's for sure. Well, I was a little worried that he didn't really understand what he was getting into. 
I, th- I think I was fairly concerned, considering that this has now been over 30 years of of tragedy and misfortune. And he kind of, I don't know if he totally realized that. I mean, as a, as a season ticket holder, nothing would make me happier than things turning around. But I just wanted him to know. You know, uh-huh. you gotta you gotta know what you're getting into. This is a franchise that weird things happen. But you know, if they get well, it's gonna be interesting if they get Iverson. I kind of kind of hope that one doesn't happen because Eric Gordon. Yeah. You saw Eric Gordon in Vegas. Like he's you don't need to take minutes away from Eric Gordon. Just let him do his thing. No, I mean Eric Gordon's gonna be he's gonna be great too. I mean he I mean, he can really score the basketball, and plus he's big too. He's got that wingspan. He's a big kid, so he's. he's I was gonna ask you about. It. He's so physical. You, you don't, because he's got that baby face, you don't realize that this guy goes in in the paint and he's banging off guys like you and Big Al and getting to the line and finishing shots. Like, it's kind of a rare skill for a 20-year-old guard. Oh, no question. But it's because his shoulders are so big and his wingspan is like 6'9", 6'10". So, I mean, he can really finish the ball in there. And plus, he's he's underrated as an athlete. He's he's pretty explosive. Yeah, I'm going to say uh, signing somebody to take minutes away from Eric Gordon uh, not something I do as the Clippers. Not the best GM. idea at this point. Yeah, no, I kind of want to let I- Iverson right now. It's just uh, right. I think it's a good idea. I really think the right, Iverson for the right team makes sense because I, I don't think he's done. I think people are underestimating him. But man, the Clippers would not be the team. So will you come back in the BS report during the season? If you have me on, I'm, I'm always down to do it, my friend. We'd love to have you. We need. We haven't designated a favorite NBA player of the uh, BS report yet. So I, I, right now you're the leading candidate. Well. I hope I stay there. That's what I always tell everybody. If I'm the favorite in something, I just hope I stay there, unless it's a bad thing. <laughs> All right, Kevin Love, we'll be rooting for you on the uh, Timberwolves this season. Good luck with everything. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. All right, thank you. Target the sun off. Whoa! Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out. This concludes another installment of the BS Report. And with all the talk about sports, Bill Simmons neglected to mention this important just breaking news, which frankly cannot go unstated. This summer, Subway is teaming up with Live Nation to bring you great food and great music for a great value. Right now, buy a Subway $5 footlong and get a Live Nation concert ticket for just $5 to some of the hottest Live Nation shows like Nickelback, The Fray, and Crew Fest 2. Ticket price does not include fees. See the nearest Subway for details.